Despite the fact that A Song of Ice and Fire is a tale about creeps, weirdos, and literal mass murderers, somehow one of the most controversial and widely disliked characters in the entire series is Sansa Stark. Sansa is undeniably not a flawless character, but her transgressions and unappealing traits pale in comparison to the vast majority of her compatriots in the world of Westeros. So, in a fictional world populated with some of the worst characters imaginable, how did a teenage girl, who spends most of her time languishing in captivity, barely doing anything at all, become such a reviled character? And more importantly, how did so many readers and viewers so dramatically misinterpret her character? There are many reasons that Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire fans seem to dislike Sansa. But honestly, a great deal of the criticisms levied towards her character seem to be driven by massive misinterpretations of her characterization and choices. So what is it that people hate, and why are they totally wrong about it? First off, one of the most common criticisms of Sansa Stark is simply that she's a mean girl. A great deal of fans seem to project whatever image they have of a classic teenage Regina George bully onto her character. And the fact that she seems to fit so perfectly into the societal expectations that she was raised in is used as irrefutable proof that she must be a total nightmare. But this seems to fundamentally misunderstand Sansa as a character. Although Game of Thrones did a pretty poor job of adapting this element of her characterization from the book to the screen, it's interesting that the A Song of Ice and Fire fandom tends to see Sansa in much the same way, despite the fact that it seems to be a total misrepresentation of her personality. Sure, Sansa conforms to the standards of Westerosi society when many of the other point-of-view characters do not. But it doesn't seem to be put on or an active choice on her part. The aspects of her personality that make her the so-called perfect lady do seem to be inherent, and her individual interests don't seem to be forced or faked. She is undeniably a product of her environment, but so is every other character in one way or another. However, even beyond that, there's a pretty obvious facet to her characterization that should theoretically make her appeal to almost all of the readers of George R. R. Martin's epic fantasy story. And that is the fact that she's obsessed with fantasy stories. Sansa is an interesting character in a meta-analytical sense because she feels like she is both a part of the story and an observer within the story. Because of the nature of her situation, she spends a lot of time hanging in the background and watching the action unfold. But her character is also fascinating in a meta sense, because she is a character in a fantasy story who wishes that she was a character in a fantasy story. And therefore, it's incredibly ironic that a bunch of people reading a fantasy story, and likely imagining themselves within that story, find Sansa so viscerally unappealing or that they presume that she is meant to be the mean popular girl of the story. And therein lies one of the significant differences between those who seem to like Sansa and those who seem to hate her. The people who dislike her seem to imagine her as the popular girl who bullied everyone in school, while the people who like her see her as essentially a relatable superfan. Everyone else might be a main character of the story, but she's the one who is a part of the story who wants to memorize every minute detail of every house and every sigil. She is literally the A Song of Ice and Fire fangirl within the world of Ice and Fire. Ergo, while she might not be the most powerful or magical or interesting character in the narrative, she's actually one of the most relatable, especially for anyone who considers himself a fan of Game of Thrones or A Song of Ice and Fire. Another one of the most interesting critiques of Sansa as a character is that she's unintelligent. It's not entirely shocking that readers and fans have come to the conclusion that she's not that clever, as quite a few characters literally call her stupid in the books, oftentimes straight to her face, and Sansa seems to internalize this insult and assumes that they must be correct. However, the reality of the situation seemingly couldn't be more different. 
One thing that so many readers and watchers seem to lose track of in the story is simply who knows what and when. Given that the books are written from a multitude of points of view, the reader themselves constructs their own narrative and is privy to far more information than any one single character is. That typically means that the reader is confused or frustrated because characters aren't acting based on information that they literally do not know. And that seems to be especially true for Sansa. People who dislike her drag her for a lot. But arguably the largest critique of Sansa when it comes to her lack of intelligence is the role that she played in Ned's death. While the notion that she even had much of an impact one way or another is a bit dubious, the fact of the matter is that she knew almost nothing about what was actually going on while it was happening and was therefore unaware of what kind of impact her actions might be having. Obviously all of the Lannisters were intentionally misleading her, and Ned specifically went out of his way to withhold vital information from Sansa about the danger that they were in. He largely pretended that everything was fine, even at the point where it was becoming a literal life-or-death situation, and Sansa acted accordingly. Strangely, a lot of fans seem to once again accuse Sansa of attempted murder when it comes to her cousin Sweet Robin. Robert Aaron is a sickly child who seems to at the very least be calmed by sweet sleep, which is administered to him by a variety of people, including Sansa. And while the danger of sweet sleep is directly mentioned within the narrative, the notion that Sansa would even know how much dangerous medicine is appropriate for a child, or that she, a girl who has spent her entire life being socialized to know her place and occupy it, would question Littlefinger, or an actual maester, about the legitimacy of his treatments, is absurd. And unsurprisingly, this actually goes for a great deal of what Sansa experiences and what people seem to dislike her for throughout the story. She does play a role in some massive events, but in nearly every instance where she does something that yields a negative outcome, she didn't have any of the necessary information to actually make a good decision. And ignorance is not stupidity. But even beyond that, one of the most interesting but frustrating aspects of Sansa as a character is that she is actually incredibly astute in many instances. She does have good instincts about who people are and when something is wrong, but the issue is that she actively tries to talk herself out of them. There are obvious situations where she very quickly recognizes that there's something off with someone else, like Joffrey or Littlefinger. Oftentimes, she'll pick up on it before many other people sense that there's something wrong. But because her life circumstances are almost completely out of her control, she convinces herself that the scary people she meets aren't that scary until it's too late. Interestingly, this is also incredibly revealing about the inherent biases that a lot of readers have against characters like Sansa, as Sansa's means of handling the uglier sides of life that she doesn't want to see is nearly identical to Ned. They both ignore really obvious problems that they know exist, but that they don't want to acknowledge. And by the time they actually come around to dealing with it, it's already far too late. However, the broader interpretation of Ned seems to be that he was an honorable man who was simply too good for the world that he lived in, while the literal child who makes the same mistakes that he does is seen as a malicious half-wit for those errors. A particularly fascinating criticism of Sansa as a character is that she's thirsty for power. It's primarily interesting because pretty much every character in A Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones seeks out some kind of power. And yet, Sansa seems to yield the most blowback for it, so it's worth asking why. There are likely some gendered and stereotype-driven elements that are making people react poorly to Sansa's behavior. I.e., many people in the broader fandom may dislike Sansa's desire for status or power, specifically because she seems like the kind of person who shouldn't want power and should willingly and constantly defer to someone else. But aside from those likely biased perceptions, what this notion of Sansa the Greedy Queen seems to fundamentally misunderstand 
is that Sansa is not actually seeking any power. She already has it. The vast majority of Sansa's storyline is driven by horrendous people who are using her as a tool to exploit her power. She's been betrothed to Joffrey. She's been forcibly wed to Tyrion. She's nearly been engaged to Willis Tyrell. She was allegedly going to marry Robin Aaron. And now Littlefinger is attempting to broker some kind of marriage pact with Harry Harding. Or, in Game of Thrones' even more horrifying twist, she was married off to Ramsay Bolton. And even aside from that, in many smaller, more nuanced ways aside from marriage, literally everything that has happened to her from the start of the story has been about someone else using her value for their own gains, almost always at her expense. But even if it can be manipulated by other people, her value is hers alone. And simply claiming the power that already belongs to her does not make her power hungry. It makes her a responsible leader. Obviously, the Sansa of the books hasn't even begun to step into her power as of yet, but it seems clear that her storyline is going in this direction. And Sansa's journey towards becoming Queen in the North in Game of Thrones is undeniably one of the most criticized and disliked aspects of her character arc. However, the negative perception of Sansa's behavior in this instance is absolutely absurd. I mean, just consider what Sansa's options are in these situations. She's a hostage of the Lannisters, then of Littlefinger, then of the Boltons. Throughout the vast majority of her journey, the most villainous characters in the entire story are attempting to control her so that they can use her for her power. If Sansa doesn't fight for her own claim and take her power back from those people, then she is ceding that control and influence to the evilest characters in the entire series. If she just let any person who wanted to abuse her power do it without resistance, she would not only be suffering horrendously herself, but the thousands of people affected by her status would suffer horrendously as well. Objectively speaking, Sansa would be doing an enormous favor to every person that her claim has influence over by wresting control of it away from these horrifically cruel and exploitative people. But honestly, she doesn't even need that excuse. Again, it's her power that she's claiming. Nothing more and nothing less. Even if the people that were abusing her weren't trying to abuse her claim as well, she would be equally as justified as anyone else who was attempting to take control of a claim that they were born with. There is, of course, a great deal of criticism that can be levied against the governing system of Westeros as a whole. But if Sansa is the bad guy for staking a claim that she inherited and suffered a great deal for, then so is everyone else who was doing the exact same thing. Sansa has learned a great deal from pretty much every person she has been held hostage by. But it seems obvious that the two characters who are poised to have more impact on her than anyone are Cersei Lannister and Peter Baelish. But the notion that Sansa is going to learn from them by becoming like them is absolutely ridiculous. Again, despite many people's beliefs otherwise, Sansa is actually a quite intelligent person. And considering the fact that she actually still seems to retain a great deal of kindness and empathy after everything that she's gone through, it seems safe to assume that no one is going to be able to abuse her to the point of her becoming an outright villain anyway. But even if Sansa was as inherently cruel or uncaring as people like Cersei and Baelish, she'd have to be an absolute idiot in order to follow in their footsteps. As the saying goes, when you play the Game of Thrones, you win or you die. And after being treated horrendously by Cersei and Littlefinger, Sansa is likely going to play a key hand in their ultimate demises. So with that in mind, why would Sansa ever want to replace them? Sansa has fully experienced what it's like to be in the disadvantaged position in these kinds of dynamics. She will ultimately come to know that no matter what happens, when people use manipulation and cruelty to get what they want, the people that they're using will always want to see them destroyed and that they will likely have an opportunity to unravel them at some point or another. Therefore, Sansa is clearly meant to learn from these characters more than anyone else. 
but she is largely meant to learn exactly what not to do when she's in a position of leadership. It's not even about her personal feelings. It is quite literally about what will or won't be effective in terms of maintaining a stable structure of power. And if Sansa wants to be a leader and stay a leader, she will inevitably realize that maintaining control or gaining influence using the methods of Cersei and Littlefinger simply will not work. However, when Sansa's actual feelings are taken into account, it seems incredibly obvious that not only is she too smart to lead in this way, but that she also would never want to. One particular common complaint about Sansa is her lack of empathy at the start of the story. But what makes her an incredibly compelling character is that in contrast to almost every other significant player in A Song of Ice and Fire, the more terrible things happen to her, the nicer and more empathetic that she becomes. She grew up in an outrageously privileged life, but once she knows what it's like to be treated poorly, she goes out of her way to be even kinder to others. And in some instances, like with Marjorie Tyrell or Dantos Hollard, she even puts herself at great personal risk to prevent them from suffering. Essentially, she learns exactly the kind of lessons that she needs to in order to be the polar opposite of a Littlefinger or a Cersei. And while Cersei and Peter have both attempted to ingratiate themselves with Sansa as some kind of deranged political tutor, Sansa has already directly rejected their darker, crueler instructions. As Cersei directly states to Sansa, the only way to keep your people loyal is to make certain they fear you more than they do the enemy. And as Sansa thinks to herself, she had always heard that love was a surer route to people's loyalty than fear. If I am ever a queen, I'll make them love me. Clearly, George R. R. Martin isn't trying to conclude his story by telling the audience that people like Cersei and Littlefinger will always emerge victorious. So Sansa's job isn't to become the new version of these people, it's to outright rebuke their outlook on life and choose a better way. Traditional femininity occupies a very strange space in nearly every corner of media. And it's painfully common to see the classic girly girls in fiction to be at best disregarded and at worst outright hated by the general audience. But George R.R. R. Martin has seemingly made Sansa into a kind of litmus test for these kind of biases in his viewers and readers. And she is a test that most people seem to fail. What makes Sansa so interesting is that according to both in-canon story rules of Westerosi society and in the external misogynistic world that we all exist in, Sansa shouldn't be who she is or be capable of accomplishing what she does. Nearly every female character in the story goes one of two ways. Firstly, there are the women who embrace something more traditionally masculine in order to get by. The Aryas and Briennes of the world have essentially abandoned or outright rejected the Westerosi woman ideal because it's something they can't adhere to. Then there are the Circes, the women who can embody many idealized aspects of Westerosi womanhood, but who weaponize their femininity and seemingly hate women in general. But Sansa is an outlier because she embraces her femininity, seems to have a deep appreciation for other women, and she doesn't change her behavior or outlook in a way where she can use her femininity in order to manipulate or exploit others. A girly girl is simply what she is and wants to be, and there isn't an ulterior motive behind it. Frankly, characters that are shamelessly feminine tend to be more widely rejected and discounted by audiences, regardless of their more nuanced characterization. Female characters are only supposed to be feminine if they're not strong or intelligent or talented enough to choose another path for themselves. But Sansa is exceptionally frustrating to many viewers and readers, because despite the fact that she is meant to be the weakest member of her societal structure, and despite the fact that everyone around her presumes that she is weak and stupid, she repeatedly outsmarts and outplays people who should, in theory, be much cleverer than she is. And she does so without ever abandoning or changing her traditional femininity. Although it's beginning to change, this type of characterization was rare in fiction. 
and it understandably throws a lot of people off. But the notion that the only strong woman is a tough, aggressive, and hardened woman who has learned every lesson in the most difficult way is so ingrained in audience expectation that the writers for Game of Thrones quite literally transformed Sansa into the character archetype that she was expected to be, rather than letting her retain her personality in spite of what she's gone through. Sansa is interesting because she subverts expectations, but she tends to subvert those expectations in a way that can be very irritating for people who believe that Sansa should never be capable of outwitting characters like Tyrion or Littlefinger. And to put it bluntly, Sansa is also the kind of character who would traditionally be exploited sexually in incredibly brutal ways. So the fact that Sansa is constantly threatened with some form of untoward assault but manages to evade all-out violation based on her wits and ability to persuade people alone doesn't fit the narrative that people believe should belong to someone like Sansa. And again, this belief is so strong and so ingrained that Game of Thrones specifically completely altered her trajectory so she could become one of those feminine girls who is treated abhorrently and learns to be a supposed badass because of it, despite the fact that George R. R. Martin outright stated that this was not in his game plan, and despite the fact that it seems incredibly unlikely that he repeatedly had Sansa escape sexual encounters she didn't want to have, just so that she could ultimately have the most nightmarish character in the series force himself on her in the end. So, it's not without irony that many of the general audience came around to Sansa in the later years of the series, although it is pretty depressing. In order for her to become a likable character in the eyes of many, she had to have her softness abused out of her and become a character entirely unlike her former self. As she repulsively said to the Hound towards the end of the series, if it weren't for all the people who exploited her, she would have stayed a little bird all her life. And that isn't just a horrific take on what Sansa actually went through. It truly seems to be exactly what George R. R. Martin wasn't trying to say with her character. One element of Sansa's characterization that makes her unappealing to most but incredibly interesting within the context of the story is that essentially, she's not really a fantasy character. She certainly had the potential to be at the start, but because her entire trajectory seems to revolve around lonely captivity, she doesn't get to do anything that the typical fantasy character does, and she doesn't have many character traits that the traditional fantasy character would. Sure, she's probably above average in terms of intelligence, and she's clearly stated to be an exceptional beauty. But in comparison to nearly every other major character in the story, she looks incredibly pedestrian. So in that sense, her lack of popularity is actually somewhat understandable and to be expected. In a world where dragons are being born, and kids are becoming kings and commanders, Reading the story of a girl who has to gray rock her way through life in order to avoid as much mistreatment as possible isn't quite as appealing. But that also completely misses the depth, complexity, and interest of Sansa as a character. Although nearly everyone who enjoys fantasy likes to envision themselves as the strong warrior or the magical prince who is capable of anything and everything, Sansa is a dose of realism that both feels out of place in the story but is a necessary component of it. Everyone wants to be the dragon queen or the warrior princess, but this is a story that is largely about traumatized children attempting to navigate a terrifying world. And although most people like to fantasize that they would fight their way to freedom and rebel against their captors were they in the same situation as Sansa, realistically, they almost certainly would not. Therefore, Sansa's presence within the narrative is an uncomfortable reflection of reality that most readers don't want to acknowledge. It's much easier to castigate her as weak and ineffectual rather than recognizing that sometimes you simply do not have the option to fight back. It's not only possible, but probable, that most people would be too disadvantaged to ever act out were they in the same situation as her. And the notion of being a captive whose best option is to simply endure whatever abuse her captors choose to heap on her is an awful one, but a very real one as well. 
However, the rejection of Sansa's victimhood is a tragedy in its own right, as nearly every person who has been abused has intentionally been manipulated into a position where it was borderline impossible for them to escape. And she is truly one of the most inspirational characters, in the sense that she suffers helplessly for a great deal of her character arc, but she doesn't let that change her into a bad person. And her future in Westeros shows that she can move beyond the bad things that have happened to her. Sure, she's not inspiring in the sense that she can stick a knife in the gut of all those who wronged her. But she's inspiring in a much more grounded and aspirational way. Because her ultimate revenge will be to break the cycle of violence that she was pulled into, and to simply not become the kind of person who abused her. And although the reflexive rejection of her character is somewhat understandable, because her experience likely hits way too close to home for a lot of people, her development is also incredibly heartwarming, as most members of the audience will see a greater reflection of themselves in a character who simply experiences the cycle of abuse and then chooses to break it, rather than becoming some mystical badass to wreak vengeance on all that have wronged her. It should actually come as no surprise that Sansa is one of the most widely disliked characters in both the Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire audiences. But that's not necessarily because she's an unlikable character. Sansa is a fascinating element of the story at large because her character has a tendency of exposing the unappealing underbellies of a lot of the fan favorite characters. She comes into conflict with, or is on the opposing side, of many situations with a lot of really beloved characters. And because she's not so overtly coded as a hero or mastermind, it's much easier to reduce the interactions that she has with characters like Tyrion, Arya, or even Ned, as Sansa being the bad guy and everyone else being the good guy, rather than acknowledging the nuance that could exist between them. For instance, Tyrion is obviously a character whose popularity outshines Sansa's by a wide margin. And it's bizarrely common for some fans to act as if Sansa should be Tyrion's reward for being so clever and so underappreciated. Or even worse, that Sansa needs to learn some sort of life lesson by being forcibly married to, but ultimately falling in love with Tyrion. These ideas are repulsive, but honestly not that surprising considering what the other option is. Because in reality, Tyrion is an adult man who willingly married a child hostage in the hopes of stealing the claim to her home. He is an adult man who is bitter that his 13-year-old wife, who has basically been kidnapped, abused, and forced to marry into the family that slaughtered her own, doesn't like him and isn't happy to be married to him. He's twice her age, and he's angry that the tween he's attracted to doesn't want to be intimate with him. When taking that point of view into account, it's not at all shocking that people like to besmirch Sansa, because to acknowledge the reality of what is happening makes Tyrion an undeniably repugnant villain, and makes Sansa his helpless hostage. It's much harder to admit that a likable character could not only treat a literal child so horribly, but would be angry that she doesn't appreciate him for it, rather than just blaming Sansa for being a spoiled, superficial brat. And although obviously her interactions with most other characters aren't taken to quite this extreme, Sansa's presence has a real knack for bringing other characters' less appealing qualities into the light. And therefore, rejecting Sansa and acting as if she deserves all the horrid things that happens to her allows fans of many characters to avoid truly examining what kind of people George R. R. Martin actually created. However, by doing so, the audience and readership miss a great deal of what makes the other characters so interesting, and miss a great deal of what makes Sansa interesting as well. Every character in A Song of Ice and Fire both embodies a specific fantasy archetype and subverts that archetype. And ironically, the archetype that Sansa both is and isn't makes her a somewhat inherently unappealing character. But that's not because of the character herself. It's largely because of what the audience expects of a character like her, 
And because those expectations are confronted and deconstructed in a really unsettling and disturbing way. Sansa is very much the damsel in distress, princess in the tower kind of character. And she does quite literally spend a great deal of her time imprisoned, waiting to be saved by a fabled hero. There is an interesting metatextual angle to this aspect of Sansa's character as well. Because her inner fantasies revolve around magical fairy tales, but she is also quite literally living out a classic fairy tale in her reality. But what makes Sansa such a unique character, in a way that is a bit of an affront to the typical narrative expectations, is that the traditional damsel in distress is not meant to be a subject within the narrative that they're a part of. They're supposed to be an object. The princess in the tower who needs to be saved by another is essentially meant to be the end goal of the actual characters in traditional storytelling. She's meant to be a metaphorical flag that needs to be captured from beyond enemy lines. But the real story is about the hero saving her, not the woman who actually needs to be saved. The damsel in distress is typically a plot device that only exists through the eyes of the real characters. And when she's not in their presence or on their minds, she essentially ceases to exist. But what George R. R. Martin fascinatingly does with Sansa is truly reveals how deranged and dehumanizing this kind of classic fantasy is. Because by letting the audience see through Sansa's eyes, it truly illuminates how nightmarish it is to be that damsel. She's not a porcelain doll without any thoughts, feelings, or relevance, outside of the prince who is meant to be her savior. She doesn't exist in some kind of neutral stasis while waiting to be saved. She's a real person who is in a real hostage situation, and she experiences a great deal of misery, pain, and even boredom as a result of her imprisonment. Being that damsel leads her through a harrowing journey of manipulation and exploitation, and her distress is literal and horrifying abuse. There's nothing charming or fantastical about it. But audiences are not used to characters like this being humanized, and they don't expect them to have a rich inner life or acknowledge the brutality of what they've experienced. So to have a character like Sansa, whose life as a captive princess is revolting and sad, is a shock to the system that a lot of people don't enjoy. However, it's an incredibly astute insight into classic fantasy. And George R.R. R. Martin has crafted a truly interesting and unique character with Sansa Stark that the vast majority of the audience apparently dislikes or is seemingly completely disinterested in, purely based on their superficial interpretations of the character. Ultimately, people are allowed to dislike whatever they dislike for whatever reason under the sun. Hating something because you hate it is entirely valid. However, when it comes to Sansa Stark, it's painfully obvious that a great deal of readers and viewers loathed her character because they completely misunderstood the points that George R. R. Martin was trying to make by including a character like her in A Song of Ice and Fire. Sansa is undoubtedly a bit of an odd man out in the broader narrative but that's largely what makes her such an interesting and worthwhile character. Her characterization is exceptionally rich in subtext, and she has one of the most realistic and relatable development arcs in the entire story. The likelihood that she will be a fan favorite by the end of A Song of Ice and Fire is unfortunately even lower than it was in Game of Thrones, as the writers of the TV adaptation radically changed the character in a way that would fulfill the expectations and appeal more broadly to the entire audience. However, Sansa is as richly complex and compelling as any other character in the series. And although many may not like her, they likely have more in common with her than any other character in A Song of Ice and Fire. But what do you think? Is Sansa a widely misinterpreted character? Or... Is she straight up unlikable for much simpler reasons? Leave your comments and opinions below. And if you're interested in more content like this, like and subscribe.